have to say that I am very impressed that we're having this conference on private international law. It has actually been a dream of mine for a long time for our two countries to start talking with each other. Sometimes I have felt, Ambassador, that after you signed the Treaty of Paris, whereby you gave you, how much did you get? 20 million US dollars? After that, you seem to have suffered a period of forgetfulness. <laughs> and I, it is somehow a bit sad that it has to take more than a hundred years for me to believe that the warmth of the relations between your country and mine, especially the sphere of law, is going to be rekindled. You know, even in my own private capacity, when I was a young law professor, I had actually tried to find a way to jumpstart projects to memorialize the work of our professor, Rubin Balai. And because in my mind, you see, he, I was his student, and I always suffered terror. And then, so you, you can put it on the record that present chief justice was so deathly afraid of Professor Ruben Balane. <laughs> because, of course, I consider him a legal genius. I consider his works, though not as many, to be of the same quality as the works of Mandelessa and Sanchez Oman. And I believe that because he has a special facility with European language, especially Spanish, he occupied a special place to, for us to try to recreate the relationship once again. I thought that because of his uniqueness, we could have a project with the Spanish government. And I had actually personally spoke with, with several representatives of the Spanish agencies before when I was in the private sector, trying to find out, is there a way of trying to build something from the fact that we have a professor, Ruben Balane, who can uh, write very, very well, not only in English, but also in Spanish. So maybe it is a hint that some of you who are quite generous can allow him to spend a few years in sunny Spain. <laughs> because I think he really deserves it. If this is not a strong endorsement, I don't know what is. <laughs> so, Mr. Ambassador, you have gone across the country and you have already impressed me with your commitment to human rights. But I also would want to find out if you have been equally impressed to find out that there are still certain areas in our country that uses a native form of a Spanish Philippine dialect. In Chabacano, you have in Cavite, and of course in the Zamboanga Peninsula, for which our Justice Adolf Ascona famously comes from. But you, you see, Spain's legacy lives not only in law. Unfortunately, no longer the currency of the legal language, but at least in the substance of the doctrines that are still embedded very strongly in our laws right now. And it is particularly pronounced in the area of civil law. So I come here bearing a message that we had actually needed a lot of help a long, long time ago. In fact, one of my, in one of my earliest speeches before the Philippine Judicial Academy, I had impressed on the audience my lament that the legal academia had not given enough attention to looking at two major codes coming from Spain that needed updating. And I am speaking about the 1932 Revised Penal Code, which comes also uh, largely from uh, the Spanish Penal Code at the time, as well as the Philippine Civil Code in 1950, which is a mixture of course, mainly of Spanish laws, but also of continental European law. You had both. Uh, you had both uh, provisions originating not only from Spain, of course, but also from France, Germany, 
and even from some of the South American countries. And I thought 1932 and 2014 when I delivered that talk, that is quite a long time for us not to be examining our soul as a nation and resolving the contradictions that arises from the fact that we have not given enough attention to these great bodies of law. When I was just a student in 1984, I wrote an article trying to examine and have a comparative analysis of indigenous Philippine law as, a, as against the national land law of the Philippines, which is patterned after the American system, which is in turn patterned after the Australian system. So I thought that precisely because of the difference in the assumptions of the current system, where you divide the world according to straight grids, where you have great planes, so you can draw straight lines. The Philippines being an archipelago with more than 7,000 islands, the boundaries are more natural. Waters coursing through lands, so those are our boundaries. The slope of mountains and the peak of mountains, those will be our natural, our natural boundaries. And in the indigenous people's conception, these are where you demarcate rights, whether they are of communal character or of individual character. And I realized that side by side the individual concept, that the individual concept of property ownership is only very limited, and the more dominant form of ownership was really a community-based system of the community only a piece of property for the development of their joint uh, need. So there is a need for us to examine our laws. Because part of the problems that we are having right now, the problem of injustice, the problem of the inability of the Filipino masses to articulate their deepest needs, arises from the fact that we have absorbed a uh, system of laws that were foreign to us. First, from the Spaniards, and then from the Americans. But it was only in the 1980s that there started to be work of scholarship in the area of indigenous law by many people. So what do you have? If it were a clinical case, you would consider it as skin, skin, uh, schizophrenia, right? So a person that is being given a set of reality that is not in accord with his or her organic state. So if we are in a state of legal schizophrenia, the remedy should have been first an analysis of the conditions which perpetrate the problem we have of self-identification. And that is why the problem of justice keeps on repeating itself because people are not able to relate to the precepts of property, to the precepts of contracts, to the relationships that are required in commercial contracts, which contrast with a very intimate and personal way by which Asians, especially Filipinos, relate with each other. That is why, Mr. Ambassador, I urge you to give this a very preferential attention. Because if we are going to really be great as a nation, we have first to recover our soul. And we cannot do that unless we are able to articulate who we are as a people. Unless we are able to express what we really want as a nation, as a community of individuals with families who are not only expressing physical and psychological needs but the higher aspirations as a nation. So I, I believe that the fact that your legacy lives, perhaps you can tell us which of these legacies still resonate with the universal values that are right now being pronounced in many international instruments and which are actually culture-specific and should have been just relegated to continental Europe and should not have been transported to us. And at the same time, 
do you have similar experiences with countries who had a mixture of traditions, both from the continental Europe and from the Commonwealth countries? Because as you very well know by now, ours is a mixed tradition. While we call ourselves a civil of countries in the sense that judgment law becomes law only when they are fully in accord with statutory, of course, constitutional definitions. We are more careful to observe boundaries than common law countries whose, whose judiciaries have the first job of first defining what the law is. On the other hand, of course, in our tradition, it is the legislature's first duty to define what the law is, and then we, the courts, interpret what the legislature intended. I am sure that in your modernization program from the 1950s up to now, you have tried to update, for example, your civil code to conform to modern commercial conventions. For example, sales conventions, transportation conventions, security interest conventions are already of an international nature in many countries. Yet our legislature still have to give even the slightest, in, slightest in attention to these needs of modernization of our legislation. The danger that we face, and one problem I don't want us to enter again, is if we will try to say we will modernize our commercial law by adopting, per se, the model of another country while forgetting that their civil code is still largely Spanish-based. Let me give you an example because in my past life, I was also a professor of civil law. And some of the deans here were my former students. So you start with persons and family relations, and this has already evolved in a great way under the law on persons and family relations, the present uh, family code right now. And we have tried to update these laws according to what we believe our society needs. That was the easy part. The harder part was really going to the construct of obligations, especially when we take into consideration that they are not just bilateral obligations right now, but the more greater number of contracts now, the larger contracts, have multi-party participants. So what do you do in such a situation? We often have the problem of legal characterization of divisible obligations vis-a-vis -vis obligations that have to be performed in stages. The commercial world would definitely have a way of defining the financial risks. So my guess is, without the benefit of studying what you have been doing, you would have already by now made the arbitration financial risks the legal standard for apportioning liability. In other words, if parties of contract have already defined that the financial risks are going to be divided in this way, then that will largely govern the way by which we attribute responsibility. But the problem seems that we are in a time freeze. We still are enamored with the concept of divisible or indivisible obligations. When obligations right now, especially in major commercial contracts, require so many parties to be exposed to simultaneous risks that are dependent on the performance of many people. There is a need, in other words, to put a matrix or a framework of analysis for a present civil code. With all humility, I think it is not enough for just to tell each other the state of our laws. That is the simple for a start. But the greater need is actually how to intervene in a way where the confusion in jurisprudence will be relieved in a way at the same time that we can translate especially to small Filipino businesses. The implications of entering into a written form of agreement which is so alien to them. 
So even assuming that we go through a modernization program, the greater problem or task is actually how to educate our people to have a more modern outlook where contracts are entered into and the impersonal aspects of the written contract are respected, something that is very alien to the very personalistic way by which many Filipino business entities conduct their work. We are still very much Asian after all, and as you can see by the romantic presentations which preceded the work of the Chief Justice in the during this lecture, we're still very much romantic at heart. So I thought actually, Dina Delari, I had to struggle with the fact that I wanted to actually relax after that sumptuous offering of the aesthetics. But now I think that the, the work that I have basically right now is to tell you about the enormity of the problems that we have. A problem that was created by our failure to examine ourselves as a people for the longest time and to draw from the resources that are actually out there that could have been pulled in from our friends across the seas. You primarily, of course, the Americans have been helping in a large way on the modernization of our commercial uh, laws. But you see, even our companies needs to understand that modern economic transactions now need really urgent attention. And somehow that attention is not being given. And we keep on entering into agreements. Agreements such as those Ambassador Dihanke used to be entering into. <laughs> and I, I, I think only he knows what he signed when he was in Geneva. I think the greater mass of people never had a, never had an opportunity to know what he was doing. I'm sorry, <laughs> he's my friend. So, if, if this is a time when our international engagement must be broader and deeper, this is also the time when I think the legal community must understand that we have enormous questions that we must face in the area of private international law. For example, the meetings of ASEAN and Chief Justices, the 10 of us agree that we are going to request the ASEAN to recognize us as a council of ASEAN Chief Justices. And because of our frequent meetings, we are now going to be talking about cross-boundary issues. And the most pressing of this is cross-border child custody issues. And in order to do that, you have to understand not only the basics of the family law of the two jurisdictions, you also have to understand civil procedure. And you have to understand the international norms governing interests of the child and who has the preference with respect to jurisdiction to hear child custody questions. But you see, the Filipinos are romantic at heart. And he who is underprivileged in the economic uh, comparison should have more sympathy. So what do we do, considering that we have more than 10 million Filipinos outside of the country who are as emotionally connected to us as anyone who is residing here is. I had thought that I would tell you what I have always felt these years, which is that in order for the Philippines to make use of the fact that it has benefited from two great traditions, Spanish tradition and the legal tradition, legal traditions, you, I think, would consider it as a continuation and a recognition of the tradition that you imparted to us to help us rise above our problems of confusion, lack of identification, lack of characterization. 
by allowing us to see tools, measures, and analytical concepts that we have used to help transform economies into the modern age. I think you are in the best tradition because you came from a history of colonization of countries in South America and in Asia of the Philippines. I think you can tell us of what the problems those countries encountered, uh, your, your former colonies encountered. And if you had reorientation projects with them on how they could modernize the laws that they inherited from you, you could actually help us in that area. And I think that we can bring the best also of the Philippine legal mind by informing the world of our love of justice, our love of democracy, our love of human rights, and our ability to pick up those Western concepts such as democracy and human rights and bring in uniquely Asian values. Asian values that focus on the community more than on the individual. So what I'm offering is a proposition that will be mutually beneficial. So with this, I think I have left the academe quite a long time ago. I miss the academe, but I am now engaged into the day-to-day -day resolution of real-life disputes of live people. And I would want the judiciary to be able to say in future that aided by legal academia, we can draw on the suggestions that our very learned professors are espousing on how we can reconcile areas of conflicts of law that have bedeviled us all these years. My duty is to inform the people that justice can be felt by them, not only in real time, but in a real way, in a way that affects their hearts and convinces their mind. Thank you very much.